We're going to get out of the Great Tribulation tonight. We're going to move into Armageddon in a week or two, but, but we're going to get out of the Great Tribulation tonight. But I literally felt it. I've just been studying all day on um, this final of three messages concerning the Great Tribulation. And I just, I was, I was in my office, so I'm going to process for a little bit here. I was in my office and I'm like, Lord, I don't think I can preach this tonight. This is just heavy, heavy stuff. He's like, oh, you're going to preach it. And I was like, yeah, I don't think you understand. He's like, no, I'm omniscient. I understand. You're going to preach it. And so I had to wrestle through it because this stuff, I don't know how you receive it when I'm preaching it, but it's like, it's Wednesday night, school's back in, people worked all day, and I'm going to tell you about the most severe wrath ever poured out on planet Earth. And you guys just keep showing up for it. So kudos to (laughs) y'all. But listen, if we can't glorify the Lord in his wrath, then I'm not sure we really have surrendered to him yet. Like, I mean, literally, he's glorified, yes, in his grace and his mercy. But when the day of his grace and his mercy comes to an end, it's the same holy, true, righteous God who's going to pour out wrath, and he expects us to even worship him in that. It doesn't mean that we dance about it or we enjoy it in the sense that we enjoy salvation and redemption and grace and mercy and forgiveness, but it does mean if he's the fixation of our attention, that means whatever he does is good. And even in Revelation 16, when the most severe display of God's holy anger is fully and finally released, on an unrepentant human population, the test of us is, are we going to respond to that emotionally or are we going to respond to that from the Spirit? And if we respond to him in the Spirit, we will say, Lord, you are righteous and good and just. You warned and warned and warned. You pled with people and pled with people. You sent your prophets. They killed your prophets. You sent your son. They killed your son. You sent your apostles. They killed your apostles. You sent all of the witnesses. They slaughtered them, and and we're looking ahead in tribulation. And finally, God says, I have given you all of the grace that I will give. And now, for those that said no to grace, there awaits only one thing. And that is wrath. And so that's where we are tonight in Romans, excuse me, in Revelation 16. So I'm going to do something they taught us to never do in Bible college. I'm going to read the entire chapter. I'm going to do it. It's 21 verses, but you can't find a stopping place until you go through all 21 of them. So this may be um, a test of your ability to focus, but Holy Spirit, come, help us, help us, Lord. Revelation 16, verse 1. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, go and pour out on on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth and harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshiped its image. The second angel poured out his bowl into the sea and it became like the blood of a corpse and every living thing died that was in the sea. The third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, Just are you, O holy one, who is and who was, for you brought these judgments. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. And I heard the altar saying, Yes, Lord God, the Almighty, true and just, are your judgments. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun and it was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were scorched by the fierce heat and they cursed the name of God who had power over these plagues. They did not repent and give him glory. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, that's the Antichrist, and its kingdom was plunged into darkness People gnawed their tongues in anguish and cursed the God of heaven for their pain and sores. They did not repent of their deeds. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, that's Satan, and out of the mouth of the beast, that's the Antichrist, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs, for they are demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them 
for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that they may not go about naked and be seen exposed. And they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, It is done! And there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a great earthquake such as there had never been since man was on the earth. So great was that earthquake. The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and God remembered Babylon the great to make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. And every island fled away, and no mountains were to be found. Verse 21. And great hailstones, about a hundred pounds each, fell from heaven on people, and they cursed God for the plague of the hail, because the plague was so severe. That, my friends, is the description inspired by the Holy Spirit, preserved in the written word of God in the book of Revelation, chapter 16, that describes the final outpouring of God's fury upon unrepentant, irredeemable mankind. And it will happen. Now, when I read through that, just like with the, the, the horn, uh, excuse me, with the uh, trumpets, just like with the seals, when I read through the bowls of God's wrath, I will tell you again, as I have each week, most of us do not have an intellectual or emotional grid that we can fully process all of that. And so there is a certain sense where you just have to accept that it's going to be horrific from the perspective of man in a way that has never been experienced by anybody on earth. And you have to discipline yourself to remember that what we just read is de the description of the God of the Bible, the God that loves you, the God that saved you, the God that shepherds you, the God that provides for you, the God that literally for all of the redeemed will wipe away every tear. The merciful hand toward us is the wrathful hand towards those who've rejected him. He's the same God. I say this very reverently. He's not schizophrenic. He's not losing his temper in chapter number 16. He's not flying off the handle. This is the full and final preparation of God's fury against sin. And in order to move into the new heavens and the new earth, no trace of sin can enter in. Therefore, God must purge the cosmos the realm of creation must purge heaven and earth of every single trace of sin, and it will be done. And so sadly for us, as we read this, we have the difficulty of being able to process it with the mind, but you've got to accept it in the spirit and let God be God. So let's walk through these seven bowls of God's wrath. And some of them will linger on a little bit more than others, but let's begin with the first bowl in verses one and two. The first bowl is described like this. John says, I heard a loud voice from the temple. My guess is, is that's the heavenly temple. And he's telling the seven angels, go and pour out on the earth, pour out on the earth, the seven bowls of God's wrath. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth. And here was the result of that first bowl of wrath, harmful, and painful sores came upon people. Who are those people? Those who bore the mark of the beast and worshiped its image. Now I want you to remember with me, by this time in the great tribulation, you've already had massive upheavals, massive pouring out of God's judgment, but these are specifically the bowls of his full and final wrath. And so what we're about to read is more intense than anything we've read. And it begins with something that is just described as the first angel immediately pouring out the bowl. And the picture in the Greek language is not a big deep bowl like we had pictured on the slides in recent weeks and on the handouts. Um, it's more of a saucer that you tip it just a little bit and its entire contents spill out quickly. And so the tipping is the angel saying, God has had this thing stored up and the angels are just waiting to be obedient to the command of a holy God to tip it. And when it tips, it all pours out. And so these seven bowls are happening one after another after another in the concept of time on earth. So there is no breathing room in between these seven bowls. These are happening in a very short amount of time. Even if these were taking place in the context of a one year time period, it's beyond imagination. 
My personal belief is that this is happening not in a matter of a full year, but likely within the matter of a month. That's my personal belief. You don't have to agree with it, but that is my personal belief that the final fury of God's wrath is so intense. And by the way, you're going to find out in these verses, the people know it's God. They know it is God doing this. So when the first angel pours it out, the result is all over the people who had willingly placed the mark of Satan on their body, the mark of the Antichrist on their body. God says, if you're into marking your body for uh, what you believe in, I'm going to mark your body for what I believe in. And God marks their body with these tumors, these sores, these lesions. And the Bible says that they are described as harmful and painful. So it means it's not just in mild irritant, but these things are harmful, meaning they carry disease. They will poison from the outside moving in, yet they will not bring death immediately. And so these sores are covering people. And I want you to think about this. Think about a global population that has been reduced, but we're likely talking still about 2 billion people on earth at least. And at this point, they are being marked by the wrath of God. Who are they? It's not Christians that are alive at that time. I want you to remember, the Bible's very clear. The Christians are immune from this. The believers are immune from this. But those that are living that have taken the mark of the beast will receive now the mark of God's wrath on their body, and it will cause torment to them. And we don't have to be stretched out too much to embrace that because we can see physically what that might look like, what that might feel like. But again, we don't understand the scope of it. It is global. And it is intense, and there's no escape, and there's no relief. Second bowl. Second angel poured out his bowl into the sea. So the first bowl was poured upon the earth. The second bowl of wrath from God by the angel was poured out into the sea. And the sea became like the blood of a corpse. And every living thing died that was in the sea. Now, again, we've already had some judgment poured out on the waters of the earth. We've had poisoned waters. We've had infected waters. We've had uh, stars or meteors from the sky affecting the world's ecological system. But at this point, this is a supernatural, not a natural means, not a comet falling, but a declaration of God that in this bowl of wrath, the effect, once it was poured out on the sea, is the entire globe, 70% of the earth's surface is covered by oceanic waters. And in this judgment, all of the waters turn into a coagulated blood. So it's not only changing the consistency, moving from liquid, but moving into a coagulation, a thicker kind of um, material. And I'm taking it literally that it is not just looking like blood, but that it is a plague of blood. Just like when God cursed the waters in Egypt in the book of Exodus, those waters turned into blood. Now, don't chase rabbits trying to figure out how that might happen in the natural. God gets to do what God wants to do. And the judgment is that when the waters of the sea turn into blood, every single marine creature dies. Everything in the sea. So you have the the judgment of God in the supernatural turning all the waters into blood, and then it's compounded that every single living creature in the sea dies and begins to putrefy and begins to rot. So now, from the seas, the consistency of the water, remember there had already been upheavals with a third of the, the world's marine ships being destroyed, But at this point, you've got thick, coagulated, undrinkable, non-processed water. It's incapable of sustaining marine life or any sense of human life, and it is unnavigable. You can't have ships that are made for water traveling through blood. So everything that is associated with the world's ocean stops, and it is cursed by God. By the way, never to be restored during the normal course of things. When the new heavens and the new earth come, the millennial reign, uh, before the new heavens and the new earth, it will be restored. But at this point, for the course of humanity, however much time they have left, there is no oceanic life and there is the, the sea is literally blood on planet earth. Then the third bowl comes in verses four through seven. So the third angel pours out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water and they become blood. And I heard the angel in charge of the waters. That's an interesting phrase, that there is a heavenly angel that is in some way superintending the planet's water sources. And this is what that angel says. Just or righteous are you, upright are you, O holy one, who is and who was, for you brought these judgments. Now look at verse six. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets 
and you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. And I heard the altar saying, yes, Lord God, the Almighty, trust and just and true are your judgments. So one of the things that you need to remember, Romans 1 opens this up a little bit, that one of the elements of God's wrath is he gives people fully over to what they wanted. So you see in Romans 1, you see this hardening of the heart and God turning people over to what is described as a reprobate mind. When people, this is the danger of toying around with sin. Because when, when people toy around with sin, they always assume that they are in control, especially in the sense of a person who might have a knowledge of God, might have some kind of in and out relationship with the Lord, at least an academic understanding of the gospel. Maybe they've even prayed and asked Jesus into their heart, but they love their darkness. They love sin. And so one of the dangers in, in situations like that is when, when people play with sin and they often think, well, I'm just going to go a little ways with it, but I'm, I'm still in control. I can always pull back. I want to just humble all of us and say, you're actually not in control. That there is a point where even a merciful, gracious God can withdraw the grace that resta- restrains you Literally, and it's an act of judgment. It's not that he's doing anything proactively to you. He's just pulling back what restrains you and you give yourself fully to the thing you want. And at that place, you can be turned over to a reprobate mind. The whole of the great tribulation is everybody that says no to God is turned over to a reprobate mind. That means they cannot be saved at some certain undefined point. And so they wanted to kill the prophets and they wanted to kill the witnesses. Remember, 144,000 Jewish witnesses on the globe at that time propagating the gospel that Jesus Christ is Messiah and proclaiming his second coming. Then you have the two witnesses that suffered mercilessly under persecution and torment. And they proclaimed and they did signs and wonders and miracles were attached to their life, but the world would not repent. And then you have countless other people, believers, not numbered with 144,000 Jewish ones that are propagating the gospel in some form of fashion during the great tribulation and nobody wants to repent and they wanted to kill all of the messengers of God and God in essence says if you are bloodthirsty I'll give you a whole ocean of blood to drink and I'll give you rivers of blood to drink that's what the angel says here it's right there in those verses he says they've shed verse 6 the blood of saints and prophets so you've given them blood to drink and then it's what they deserve Now, you and I are not positioned to be able to say in this day and age, ha ha, you got what you deserve because we are recipients of grace. We are recipients of mercy and we should always be seeking the redemption of people. So don't set yourself up in a high and mighty place to point fingers and say, ha ha, you're getting what you deserve. Because frankly, people that didn't get what we deserve ought not to be pointing fingers at those who do get what they deserve. So we're going to operate in grace and humility. But in this season, that's not there. And so under the altar are the martyrs who have been crying out saying, God, when will you avenge our death? And remember, we have already covered that. And God said, I will avenge you when the number of the martyrs is complete, when your brothers have suffered, when that number is complete, I will avenge you. And here's the vengeance. And so now under the altar, you hear this cry saying, yes, God, the Lord Almighty, true and just are your judgments. So I want you to think with me in the natural realm here. And again, It's going to be radically immeasurably different on earth than it is now, but it'll still be earth. There will still be humans. And this this paradigm here is that all humans now left on earth at this time have zero drinking sources. No water, no fresh water, no oceanic water to be processed. There is no water. So this is how I know this is happening in a very short time. Because you and I both know that with zero water, you can't sustain life for very long. But it's about to get worse because even as the water dries up, we're about to find out here in a moment that the sun turns. And listen, I get global warming. Let me tell you where actual global warming comes from. It comes from the bowls of the wrath of God. You know, people are talking about what's going to happen in, you know, 3,000 years if we don't fix this thing. I'm like, oh, friend, it's going to happen long before then. It's not going to have anything to do with what the, what the ecological factors are down here on earth. It's actually going to be a demonstration of the wrath of God. So here we go, the fourth bowl. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch people with fire. 
They were scorched by the fierce heat. Now watch this. Here's their response. They cursed the name of God who had power over these plagues. They did not repent and give him glory. Now one might wonder, could they have still repented? Well, all we know is they wouldn't. Uh, there, earlier in the book of Revelation, when there were some judgments, I think it was one of the earthquakes, one of the <laughs> minor in comparison to this one we're about to talk about, one of the smaller earthquakes, people repented. But at this point, whether they could have or not, they didn't. Remember, when they were hiding themselves in the caves from the Lamb and the one who is seated on the throne, all throughout the seals and the bowls, excuse me, the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls, they know it is the God of the Christian, the God of the Jew, that is pouring out these things on earth. And instead of repenting, they got more hardened. So the, the idea that we might feel sorry for them, we might, listen, people question these kind of passages. And what kind of God is this? I don't know if I'm going to have anything to do with a God like this. Well, my friend, God's not on trial. So if you're, if you're putting God on trial, you're already in trouble. Like this is where you tremble before the holy God and it makes you thank him all the more for the grace that has been shed upon your soul and my soul that we, we don't have to worry about these things, that we will not encounter personally the direct wrath of God because we, we have had all of the wrath due us taken by his son Jesus. So there's no wrath left for the believer. So this sun bowl affects literally the sun that may still be up when we walk out after this service. You're going to look up tomorrow morning and you look at that sun. I want you to recognize it is that sun that the angel in some form or fashion is going to pour out the wrath of this fourth bowl. And as soon as he does, the intensity of the heat of the sun gets to the point where literally people are scorched by simply being outside. And it's, we're not talking about a sunburn. We're talking about burns. We're not talking about turning pink at the beach for all of my fellow Irish people out there, and Germanic people out there. You know, white guy like me, I get out on the beach and if I don't have the proper lotion on, I'm going to be one red lobster. But when we're looking at this, it's instantaneous. It was allowed to scorch people with fire. So it could be anything from radioactive impact to just simply the heat and the burning on the surface of the skin. But it says they were scorched by fierce heat and their response was not God have mercy on me, but God, we curse your name. And they would not repent and they would not give him glory. Fifth bowl. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in anguish. And verse 11, again, they cursed the God of heaven for their pain and sores. And again, John remarks, they did not repent of their deeds. I'm going to make an observation here. All of these bowls are happening simultaneously. I don't think we're permitted to say one bowl begins and ends, next bowl begins and ends, next bowl begins and ends. I believe that they're happening and there's overlap in all of them. So I want you to think about this. Intense, unprecedented, massive scorching heat from the sun, which also goes black. So the whole world and the domain of the Antichrist, when it says the bowl was poured out on his throne, some people believe a literal throne of the Antichrist situated somewhere in the world, perhaps Jerusalem. And other people would just say the throne represents the entire dominion of the Antichrist. I don't know, but I will say this. It affects everything that is under his dominion, and that is the whole world at that time. So the whole world is plunged into complete blackness. Let me tell you one of the, when you read the New Testament, and sometime in the Old Testament, descriptions of hell, you're going to find out, especially with Jesus' words, that Jesus describes hell as a place of fire and utter darkness. And when we think of fire, we think of heat and light. 
But the fire of hell is absolute darkness and scorching heat. And here we have it in the fifth bowl being poured out. You have these two bowls where absolute heat, unprecedented, hits the earth and utter darkness to the point where people are gnawing their tongues in agony. And so in essence, it's hell on earth. And I'm not being flippant with that phrase. Hell begins to manifest. God says, you have chosen your loyalty. You have made your allegiance. You have said yes to the Antichrist. His mark is upon you. I put my marks upon you in the sense of judgment. And since you have sided with Satan and his messenger, the Antichrist, let me give you a foretaste of damnation right there on earth. Absolute, utter, incomprehensible, inky blackness that is thick. They can't see anything. Only those that have been blinded could know what that means to have no sense of penetrating light that enters into the eyes. And it's absolute darkness. And it's all over the globe. And the Bible says they still won't repent but they amplified their cursing of the God of heaven. I I would say that this was not a new thought to John because John, of course, walked with Jesus. John would have been in some fashion a student of the Torah, the Hebrew Bible. And in Joel chapter two and three, you have these descriptions of the great day of the Lord. It's described as a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. The sun and moon grow dark and the stars lose their light. Then in Zephaniah chapter one, verse number 15, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. And then Jesus says, in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The, the, the expression of darkness is is attached to the domain of evil and wickedness. It is the realm of Satan. And when we think about darkness and you think about the things in in our lives that are all around us, may God open our eyes to see the spiritual parallel to this physical darkness. Like when we look in the world around us, do you discern light and dark? Do you see what is of the Lord? Do you see what is of the enemy? Do you see in all things? Like, friends, I'm just going to go ahead and pass to you for a moment. When it comes to entertainment, it's 99% darkness. When it comes to the music that we easily pipe in, we, we think to ourselves, well, it's not too bad, but that darkness remains in us. The light tends to pass through us, but that darkness from the evil one, to never forget, I'm just going to get old-fashioned on you, never forget that Lucifer, many people believe that he was the worship, angelic worship leader before he was cast out of heaven. He loves music. And so when we're thinking about the darkness in the world, and I don't have to look at entertainment or Hollywood or anything, I know that sin crouches at the door. We have potential for darkness in our own lives. And when we tolerate the darkness, I want you to think of the furthest amplification of darkness, and this is what hits the earth. So get radical about consecration. You should not be upset as upset with the culture as you are with any trace of sin in your own life. I just lost half of you. It's so common for us to be outraged at that sin in that group or that sin in that person or the sin in this institution. And meanwhile, we look in the mirror and we're like, yeah, but I'm okay. And I'm thinking to myself, if we're ever going to get radical, let's don't get radical about that out there until, until and unless we're radical about this potential right in here. Because when I read this, I'm not really thinking, I'm, I'm not saying with the angel in the, in, the, um, in, in the third bowl, yeah, they deserve it. I'm not thinking that right now. I will then. But what I'm thinking right now is actually, I deserved it, but I escaped it because Jesus took it. And so I'm thinking to myself now, I want to get radical about any darkness in me. Because when I see darkness unchecked, I see the fifth and the sixth bowl. The fifth bowl is the whole world plunged into darkness with people cursing the God of heaven. Sixth bowl. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates. 
and its water was dried up, to prepare the way for the kings from the east. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, and remember in the book of Revelation, the dragon is always Satan, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. What are they? Verse 14 is very clear. They are demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole earth, the whole world, to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. Pause here. That is a reference to the forthcoming battle of Armageddon. And then verse 15 is what we call a parenthetical. It's a parenthesis statement. And God speaks, I believe this is Jesus speaking, behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. And verse 16 takes us back to the demonic spirits and the kings of the earth. It says they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Okay, I'm gonna do a whole message, at least one, on the battle of Armageddon. But let me tell you right here that when the sixth bowl is poured out, it's an interesting type of judgment. Because in this judgment, God provides assistance to the enemies of Christ. He provides assistance because when this sixth bowl is poured out, the Euphrates River, that eastern boundary to the, uh, in, in the Middle East towards Jerusalem, it is dried up. It is the longest river in that part of the world, and it is completely dried up, completely. Now, I want you to remember, when the sun does its thing in a radioactive, overheated, scorching manner, the polar ice caps are going to melt. Massive water is going to flood in, but as soon as it touches the ocean, it all becomes blood, just like the rest of it. Same with the rivers. But that amount of water coming in is going to drastically change the topography. And so it's going to widen the banks of any existing river, but then that same sun dries up everything that might have been in the Euphrates. Now, when that water comes crashing down from the melting caps and the mountains and all the snow around the globe, it's, it's going to, again, change the topography. Any bridges that might have crossed the Euphrates, and there's many, they're gone. There's no way for the armies of the world, when they come together to come against Christ and the city of Jerusalem, there's no way for them to cross over from the east. And so what God does is God actually dries up the Euphrates so they can move through on dry land. They're going to see it in a demonic way. By the way, don't forget, they're under a demonic deception. So the unholy trinity of Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet some way from their mouths, and it speaks of communication or influence, they will be demonically sending out messages of influence accompanied by some form of signs and wonders, according to verses 12 through 16. And it is going to embolden the kings of the earth who are watching all of the stuff that is happening on planet earth. One last gasp, we have to get all of our armies together. We've got to go against Jerusalem. We've got to destroy those people. And so, here we go. Jesus says, because this is somewhat overwhelming, and John's readers may have very well been shaken and rattled, but this little verse 15 is like a parenthesis. The Lord, all throughout the book of Revelation, you're going to find this. There's moments where the Lord seems to call a timeout and say, before you get overwhelmed, I want you to remember, I'm yours and you're mine. I'm coming like a thief. And you're blessed if you stay vigilant, if you stay awake, if you stay alert. It is a military metaphor. So I've not been in the military. I thank God for those of you that have. We thank the Lord for your service. But I do understand this. In a battle scenario, an act of wartime, um, there are normal bodily functions. You got to shower, you got to bathe, you got to change clothes. There's times where you're out in, a, in an area where you're situated and maybe enemy is in the area and you may have to get clean. And, and the emphasis is this, you don't want to be caught naked on the battlefield and unprepared when the enemy's coming your way. That's the metaphor that's in play here. And the spiritual application is this, don't be caught without your weaponry. Don't be caught unprepared. Don't be caught and be ashamed that you weren't ready when you were warned ahead of time about what's coming your way. Dress yourselves, gird up your loins, put on the armor of God and be ready to fight because the enemy is relentless now and he will be very relentless in that day. 
So the application for all of us, I don't have to wait till I get into the great tribulation to apply this. This has a, a, a micro application right now. Like the enemy is not on holiday. He knows he's, his time is short and he's angry. And so whereas it may appear to you and I that we are on, you know, this is a little bit of a playground. We do a little church, we do a little service, we do a little giving, we do a little this and we do a little that. Don't ever let yourself get deceived that this is a playground or a picnic ground or a campground. It is a battleground. This world and this life, somebody gently rebuked me for this in the last month or so. A very transparent person, I understand, pardon me, understand the, the struggle but the teaching of the book of Revelation, some of the teaching I've been doing on Sundays, left this individual a little frustrated. And the expression was, I'm tired of hearing about war and battle. We need to talk about love. And I'm thinking, yes, there is a time and a place. But God is love. But I'm going to hear, I want you to hear me. He's not only love. Scriptures say the Lord is a man of war. And we are called soldiers who need to put on the armor. And the Bible describes the Christian life as a fight, as a battle, as a wrestling match. It is not a carnival. It is not always a festival. Sometimes it's straight up a fight. And if you show up to a fight with a casserole dish because you think it's a festival, you're going to lose. And so when I'm, when I'm applying this and I'm preaching this, I don't ever want to be the guy who is so consumed with the fight that I miss the joy of the Lord, but I don't want to ever be so blindly attached to the nicer, sweeter, lighter components of the Christian life that I'm AWOL for the battle. So I don't want to get into the, the battle of Armageddon yet, but it's, it's just amazing how God, again, is, assists the enemies by giving them what they long for. And when they get what they long for, as they get it, they find out it was judgment. So just picture massive confederation of all of the existing earth's armies at that time. <clears throat> and they're coming up to make war on Jerusalem against the saints. And they're coming there. Jesus has not come back yet. And they're thinking, we're going to destroy this place. Have you ever paused or recently paused to wonder, why do people hate Jews and why do they hate the Jews being in Jerusalem? Why do they hate that? Why has there been this great never-ending conflict for thousands of years on this tiny sliver of land in the Middle East? Why all the wars? Why all the fighting? Why would there be a Hitler convinced he has to exterminate all of the Jews? Why would there be a Haman in, 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 in the book of Esther and, and wanting to exterminate that first Holocaust, get rid of all of the Jews? Why all the decrees against the Hebrews? Because Satan hates the Jewish people because from the Jewish people came the Messiah. And God's covenant with Abraham brought glory to the Jewish people and specifically the seed of Abraham, Jesus Christ. And Satan always wanted that glory for himself. So he will forever go after Israel. He will forever go after the people that are the apple of God's eye. And in this case, they think, okay, the Euphrates has been dried up by this natural disaster of the scorching sun. And we no longer have to build bridges. We can go across on dry land and an innumerable amount of armies are going to come. Now, I'm, I said I was going to preach the Battle of Armageddon. I'm starting to do it. So let me just back off for a second. Tune in next time. Wait, there's more. Let's do the seventh bowl. Okay. Verse 17, the angel, the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air. Just pause for a minute. So these bowls poured out on the sea, poured out on the waters, poured out on the sun, and finally the air. God's wrath is comprehensive. No place to run, no place to hide. The hiding place is Jesus. If you don't know him, you must. I don't take it for granted that any, everybody in the room knows Jesus. I'm just saying knowing Jesus is not equal with going to church. Salvation is a surrender. 
And there must be a time where you just give, you, you raise the white flag and you say, I'm yours. And if I'm not yours, I'm damned. So I am yours. And you do it by faith and he's never turned away a single human being that has come to him and say, Lord, I repent, I surrender, I'm yours. He's never said, nope, not you. Everybody that repents and believes, he takes in. And so I appreciate all of the stuff that we do in our churches. I'm a pro-local church guy, but church is a hiding place for many a damned soul. So don't be a church member if you're not a member of the body of Christ. And if you're a member of the body of Christ, become a church member. So the angel pours out the seventh bowl. When he does so, a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne. So this is the voice of God saying, it is done. Now pause there. The seventh bowl, as it's being poured out, the voice of God, can I paraphrase? I'm not messing with the word, says, that's the end of it. This is the final outpouring of my intentional fury upon the inhabitants of earth who have rejected me and my son. He says, it's done. Now look at what happens in the seventh bowl. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder. And note this, because we've seen the lightning, the rumblings, and the thunder before. But look in this description, a great earthquake such as there had never been since man was on the earth. So great was that earthquake. The great city, that is a reference to Jerusalem. Some believe it's a reference to Babylon. I do not believe it is a reference to Babylon. I believe it's a reference to Jerusalem. The great city was split into three parts and the cities of the nations fell. And God remembered Babylon the great to make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. So you've got the great city, the cities of the nations, and then you've got Babylon, three distinct areas. So you've got Jerusalem, all of the cities of the world, and God says specifically of Babylon, which we're not covering tonight, that is, if you want to put it this way, it encompasses, there's, it's the mystery of Babylon, so we don't know positively what Babylon represents. I personally believe that Babylon represents the entire domain of the Antichrist regime and all things that say no to God. Do I believe it's in a certain city? I do believe there will be a headquarters, so to speak, situated in a city. I don't know where that city is. Maybe it is in Iraq. Maybe it's that ancient city of Babylon revived. I don't know. But what I want you to get out of this is that this earthquake levels every single city to the ground. London leveled. New York leveled. Paris leveled. Sao Paulo leveled. Beijing, leveled. You, you, you go over into the places in Egypt, Alexandria, leveled. Brisbane, Australia, gone. Atlanta, Georgia, leveled. The earthquake shakes everything that can be shaken until only that which cannot be shaken remains. And it's very interesting. Jerusalem split into three parts is not described as being leveled. And if everything else is leveled, then Jerusalem is elevated. It could very well be because the mountains and the islands and all of the ecological stuff, it would seem to be, and remember, in a pre-flood world, there were probably not valleys, not massive mountains. All of that is a result of the ecological disaster when the great flood hit the earth and carved its way through the topography of planet earth. Most of earth would have been somewhat flat at that time. And it seems to be that God says, we're about to renew the heavens and the earth. I'm going to, head and, I'm going to go ahead and get started by leveling everything except my city, Jerusalem. And Jerusalem may very well be the centermost and highest point on the earth at that time. And that would be fitting because guess who's about to rule and reign from there? Jesus Christ, the son of God. So all of this great earthquake and we, again, I don't have, maybe you've got a better imagination than me. I, my brain starts hurting when I try to think of how, how is this going to happen? Just God. That's how. God. And so it says that in verse 20, if you can throw that verse back up. 
Every island fled away and no mountains were to be found. So I'm not making that stuff up about the earth going flat. No mountains were to be found. Now, verse 21 is where we're going to end because there's still people that survived all of this. There's still people on earth that survived this. And this is what the Bible says, great hailstones, about 100 pounds each, fell from heaven on people. And what was their response? They cursed God for the plague of the hail because the plague was so severe. We have a geologist in our church, Polly Bowker is a geologist, and we have some people with scientific degrees um, educated in the sciences. I'm not one of them. I hated science and I hated math. Give me something to say and I'll pass the class. Make me do math or science, I'm doomed. But I am told that the largest and heaviest hailstones, like in our lifetime, are around two and a half to four pounds. These are described as around 100 pounds. And they're falling from the heavens. And there's nowhere for people to hide because the earthquake quake has destroyed everything. And they're plummeting on people. Again, people with the mark of the beast, people who have defied God, people who are, according to the angel, getting what they deserve. And that is where the seventh bowl ends. And the history of humanity, really before this, but at this point, is sealed every living person at that point who has not repented and bowed will be damned. That is the history of the human race in America. It began in a garden with no sin and it ends under the judgment of God throwing down 100 pound hailstones because people won't repent of their sin. So it's heavy, it's intense. In a certain way, it's terrifying. And I'm not above reminding all of us that are in the room, those that are watching online, those that'll watch later on our media streams, I'm not above taking a moment where we're talking about the wrath of God. I'm not above harnessing this moment and asking you, where do you stand with God? Where do you stand? I'm not asking you to travel back in time and try to find out if that moment you asked Jesus into your heart was real or not, because that's a waste of time. What I'm asking you is, where do you stand, present tense? Who is Jesus Christ to you? A good idea? A, a, a moral example? An amazing historical prophet? Or maybe you were like I was. I always believed theologically he's the son of God who died on the cross and rose from the grave. I believed all of that, but I would not give myself to it because I understood that if I ever said that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he expected me to live it. So I always believed it, but I always took a step back because I knew even in my unregenerate state that you can't say you believe and then live like you don't. You can't say he's Lord, but you still want to rule. You can't declare that your life belongs to him and his mission, but still live protecting your own. And so when I talk to people in these days, and I believe we're in the last of the last days, when I talk to people about soul issues and I have an opportunity, I don't, I don't want them because we're so trained to go, well, yeah, I was saved on August 4th of 1994. That's my testimony. But if I didn't have that radical encounter to know that everything shifted on that day 28 years ago, what I would need to know is, is he real now? Because if that was real then, he'll be real now. And so that's what I tell people to do. Who is he to you right now? And if he hasn't been real to you or you're caught in that place where you're not sure or you're wondering or you're scared that maybe it's not real, I'm not going to ask you to go back and start doing things to make that moment real. I'm going to ask you right now in this moment, surrender. Just surrender. Don't try to get back in the weeds and try to untangle stuff. Just say, okay, what he requires of me daily is to pick up my cross, to die to myself, to believe that he's Lord, to trust in his grace, to know that I cannot do this on my own. Like you can't be a Christian on your own. You can't. God wired it where I can't be a Christian without Christ. So it's not about modifying our behavior or, you know, doing these nine things better. It's really just this broken place where we have to live, where we just say, I need you. 
Like, I need you. Remember the old song? I need you every hour. Like, that's the mantra of the Christian. I need you every hour. We're not chest-thumping, strutting religious people. We're people that are so grateful that God, God the Son came seeking us so he might save us. And the only response to somebody, from somebody that really gets that, the only response to knowing that the Son of God came to seek and to save us is to surrender to him. So I want you to bow your head and close your eyes. I'm done preaching. And I don't mind just a, a little bit of silence. Because we're all in different places today, maybe even a different place than you were yesterday, but here we are, let's, let's just be here. Can you by faith right now just lay everything down before him? Will you lay your past down, all of it? Quit trying to work it off, you can't. Quit trying to manage the guilt. Put the guilt where it belongs. Jesus says, lay it on me. Lay your guilt on me. I know how to carry it. Put your past on them, the shame, even the good stuff, like your pride. Put your, put your self-righteous religious pride in the past. Just put it on Jesus. And then if you're consumed by your future, will you entrust that to him right now? You're made for more than worrying about money or being alone. Or what's going on with the kids or the grandkids or the spouse? That's not your portion. Surrender that. Turn it all over to him. Your future belongs to him. But you have to do all of that in the present moment. He's not ashamed of you. He's not embarrassed. He's not confused about what to do with you. So in this present moment, just say, Jesus, I'm giving it all to you right now, all over again. I'm yours. So, Father, thank you that even from Revelation 16, we can get an eternal perspective on where we're standing right here today. And I ask you for a strange anointing to be released on the willing tonight a unique anointing. I pray that there will be some in this room in this simple moment of waving the white flag that will feel your peace come upon them from this day forward like they never have before. That unhealthy striving to earn something would be flung off of them. And Lord, a deep satisfied and trusting life of sacrificial servanthood would find them, but it would be a joy and a freedom like they've never experienced. Let your peace rest upon us. And Jesus, we pray in accordance with the book of Revelation, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly in your name. Amen.